Okay, well, I'm uh, really flattered to be here today and uh, flattered that the Maxwell Institute would invite me to participate in the devotional. Um, my eagerness to accept the invitation, I think, uh, really says a lot about how I feel about the importance of talking about these kinds of issues uh, here on campus. Um, uh, as I already mentioned, I am a faculty member in the English department. I'm also involved in the American Studies program. And a lot of what I uh, spend my time uh, teaching about and, and writing about is about cities. So probably not the like, first thing that you would expect to hear about at a uh, devotional during Green Week uh, dedicated to sustainability. A lot of people, I think, in our culture view cities as um, the kind of uh, the, the real threat to uh, nature. There's a kind of long anti-urban history in our culture that, that um, kind of has, has us thinking about cities in this way. But, Hopefully, um, I'll, I'll suggest that uh, cities do have something to do with sustainability and, and spirituality. Um, I'm going to start off, really what I'm going to do today is, is kind of tell you a, a, my personal story. Um, so I'm going to start off by uh, talking about my childhood. I'm a bicentennial baby. Uh, I was born in 1976 and spent uh, most of my life growing up in California's Central Valley um, during the 1980s. Um, Here's a picture of me in that, uh, in that beautiful place, Merced. Uh, well, my first two decades of life coincided with what uh, might be considered the strongest surge of anti-urbanism in the 20th century. Uh, I didn't spend much time in cities within Merced's orbit. Um, our urban adventures primarily consisted of visits to the Oakland Temple uh, or to Candlestick Park to cheer on the San Francisco Giants. Um, but my culture taught me to be very afraid of cities and the people that lived in them. Uh, news coverage of the 1992 LA riots. There's a visit to San Francisco. Uh, but the news coverage of, of the 1992 LA riots, which were a, which were a response to the, to the acquittal of the LA PD officers who senselessly beat Rodney King in March of 1991, solidified for me many of the fears uh, that I had of cities, um, specifically of fears of uh, black urbanites as angry, lawless, lazy, um, well, fueled by the media landscape of the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, one of my recurring nightmares featured my family driving through Oakland or San Francisco, realizing we were almost out of gas, getting off at an exit that we didn't know much about uh, and being accosted. Uh, by a, an inner city gang. This nightmare and my broader anti-urban biases were cer certainly rooted in anti-black racism upon which many of the urban narratives that I grew up with were, were uh, founded. More specifically, my fear of cities was grounded in a deep uneasiness about sharing space with strangers. My fear, especially those who did not talk or look like me. My suspicions about urban spaces Public urban spaces were the historical by byproduct of, among other things, the post-war white flight from cities and intense suburbanization that had radically reshaped America's physical, cultural, and racial landscape during the second half of the 20th century. Although Merced, California was not a suburb in a literal sense, um, my spatial habits were very much suburban. I spent much of my life in private spaces, private swimming pools, private basketball courts, uh, private baseball fields. It was, in a lot of ways, a really, really good life, uh, dreamy in many ways. But it wasn't a life spent in uh, public spaces, really. But when I moved in the fall of 1999 to start graduate school at Boston College, I carried many of these fears that I had grown up about big cities with me. These anxieties only intensified when uh, I arrived in Boston with my mom on September 1st a day when most of the city's thousands and thousands of students uh, uh, returned and when about 80% of the city's rental leases turn over. This is kind of what it looks like. This is not kind of what it looks like. This is what it looks like. <laughs> um, it was uh, apocalyptic. I mean, Boston felt so scary to me uh, when I arrived that I opted to stay in my mom's hotel room uh, near the Rhode Island, uh, Providence, Rhode Island airport uh, on that first night rather than in the apartment that I had rented uh, near Cambridge's Central Square. I thought to myself that night, what in the world am I doing here? But after I and the rest of the city settled in, when the sidewalks were no longer uh, clogged with futons, so many futons, 
So, I mean, and if I had a futon, I would leave it on the sidewalk as well, <laughs> I think. Um, so many futons, and, and when the uh, moving trucks uh, cleared, um, I, uh, I, I found that the stories my culture had fed me about cities uh, did not prepare me for the deep joy and satisfaction that I would find in urban life. So over the next eight years, I, we, I lived in Boston for eight years, um, I fell in love not just with Boston, but with urban life, with the patterns of thinking and moving and interacting uh, in which Boston invited me to participate. So I want to share uh, uh, this evening some of the lessons that Boston and other cities taught me, lessons that have helped me, I hope, live more uh, responsibly on a planet facing significant environmental crises, uh, the constants of, uh, of which are unevenly experienced, and how to participate in the creation of a Zion society. I should probably add here really quickly uh, uh, that my deep love for Boston and city life uh, may have something to do with the fact that just a few days after the apocalyptic great move-in day, uh, I met and got to know Anne Hinckley while swimming in Walden Pond. Uh, we married each other about a year later. <laughs> Sorry, this has been really nostalgic for me, actually. Uh, spent our first year of married life in England uh, and then moved back to Boston to live for seven more years where we uh, welcomed four of our six kids into our family and into the world. Okay. Well, when we returned to Boston from what was essentially a one-year honeymoon in England, uh, I was technically going to school, but we traveled a lot. Um, uh, Anne and I interviewed with Paul and Tina Schmid, who you can see here on the, on the steps. Um, we interviewed for a position to be live and help as chefs, caterers, grocery shoppers, dog walkers, uh, launderers, and chauffeurs. Uh, in return, we lived rent-free in the basement apartment of their brownstone row home in one of the city's most charming neighborhoods, the South End. Our living arrangement blurred what had been, up to that time, in my mind, uh, a line between private and public space. While we could close the door to our basement apartment, giving us some privacy, um, uh, we spent most of our time uh, in spaces we shared with the Schmids. Both we and the Schmids used the door underneath the brownstone staircase to access 178 West Canton. You can see it just to the left there of, of Ann and I. Um, and that put us into the kind of main level floor, which was really this kind of shared space. It's where we spent a lot of time cooking, uh, meals in their kitchen, meals which we had no idea how to, how to uh, make. The only interview question they asked us when we interviewed with them, with them was, do you know how to read a recipe? Um, and we, we both know how to read, and we answered yes, we know how to read a recipe. Um, we knew we were in trouble when on like the second or third meal we cooked, uh, it called for vodka, and we had no clue what vodka was or how to find it. We could not find it anywhere. I had to go to the corner liquor store uh, and ask them to find me some vodka that we could then light on fire um, for, for the meal that we were making. Um, anyway, so we spent a lot of time there. We spent a lot of time in their uh, uh, back garden, um, uh, which backed up to a African-American church where we could overhear a, a beautiful gospel choir singing on Sunday mornings. Uh, and we ate out here a lot, as did the Schmids, when the weather was nice. Um, and we spent a lot of time hanging out on those front brownstone steps, uh, especially on Halloween, uh, chatting up neighbors as they walked by on the uneven red brick sidewalks. Well, our domestic living situation was the clearest expression of a much deeper condition of interdependence that we experienced while living in Boston. We spent most of our days in the kinds of shared public spaces that I had feared so much when I was growing up, on the city's sidewalks, at subways, and in its public squares with mostly strangers. Carrying out so much of our lives in the urban commons made it very clear to me that I depended upon others, most of whom I did not know and who did not look and talk like I did, to share their resources with me and my family. Some of this resource sharing involved a direct exchange between us and others like the Schmids. <clears throat> but our interdependencies more often entangled us with strangers, people that we didn't know. Because we didn't have a backyard with our own swing set, we spent a lot of time with our kids in Boston's large and small public parks alongside other parents and children. Because we didn't have um, a car for the first several years we lived in Boston, 
we relied upon public transit. Um, uh, we, we relied upon public transit to get us to church, school, markets, and social events. And even after we got a car, we continued to depend upon uh, public transit to get around the city uh, because of its convenience and because of its low cost. I loved commuting with other urbanites, letting go of the pretension that I could control how fast I could make it from one destination to the next and seeing all of the different things that people were up to in the city. Because we didn't have the money to purchase or the space to store books, we depended upon public libraries to supply us with reading and listening materials, as well as educational programming for our kids. If our economic circumstances are what initially pushed us into the public realm, we found life in the urban commons so rewarding that we wanted to spend as much time there as possible shopping in outdoor markets where we could talk with those who grew our food, attending concerts at the Hat Shell on the Charles River Esplanade, or Shakespeare plays in the Boston Common, or cheering on uh, Boston marathoners, one of our favorite days in the city, uh, as marathoners crossed the Boylston Street finish line and celebrating our hometown teams during, during the frequent ticker tape parades of the 2000s. The 2000s were really good for Boston sports teams. <laughs> Uh, the, the Red Sox reversed the curse uh, in the early 2000s and won other uh, championships, as did the Celtics and Patriots. Well, the, inter, the intricate relationships and interconnections into which we entered through Boston's public spaces situated us in a network of what Jane Jacobs referred to as mutual support. And Jane Jacobs is one of my uh, uh, heroes, uh, and her 1961 masterpiece, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, uh, really changed the way I thought about cities. Uh, it put to words all of the things that I was feeling as I moved uh, through uh, Boston. Well, in The Death and Life of Great American Cities, Jacob offers a compelling and frequently cited metaphor for the kind of mutual support uh, that um, I discovered there. Jacobs compares the movement and exchanges of city dwellers just outside of her home in the West Village of New York City to an intricate ballet in which the individual dancers and ensembles all have distinctive parts which miraculously reinforce each other and compose an orderly whole. This urban dance was not performed exclusively by a cast of friends or even acquaintances. Rather, it included a mix of residents, workers, and tourists who, um, who for the most part, did not know one another. The ballet on Hudson Street did not grow out of a social order that had already achieved harmonious consensus, but instead came together as different people bent on different purposes, appeared at different times, but using the same streets. The mere presence of different kinds of people on Hudson Street and its tributaries allowed each of them to provide one another with the kind of intricate mutual support that gave the individual dancers the freedom to make and carry out countless plans. Well, uh, many of you are probably aware of studies that suggest that cities are the most sustainable places to live because city dwellers consume less energy per capita than those living in dense settlements. Well, the truth of these claims are more complicated than they might initially sound. I'm persuaded by their logic that the more we can share resources, especially the en energy resources that are so harmful to the planet, the better, better off our environment will be. But I also want to suggest uh, this evening that cities are key to a more sustainable future because their public spaces have the capacity to generate an awareness of and delight in the mutual support that we and every living thing uh, in this world depend. And this awareness is critical to our efforts to address environmental emergencies and to create a more sustainable future. To make adjustments to comfortable, lifestyle, to comfortable lifestyles, we must feel an obligation to sustain the human and biological networks upon which we depend. Urban life exposes the deceptive logic of the private spaces in which we spend more and more of our time. I want to suggest that hanging out more in the urban commons undermines the misconception that we can be self-reliant and reminds us that every political, financial, and social choice we make has consequences that extend beyond our private spheres and lives. I sometimes joke that heaven had better look and feel like, the Bo like Boston's South End. Man, look at that. Uh, but I am not joking when I suggest that the networks of mutual support from which I benefited and to which I hope I contributed while living in Boston and here in Provo 
are a vital element of the Zion societies towards which our theology points us. When I, read, when I read in 4th Nephi about the 200 years of peace and happiness that existed after Christ's visit to the Americas, I cannot help but think that physical space was one of the most important things that the people had in common among them. A Zion society in which there are not rich and poor, bond and free, but in which all are made free and partakers of the heavenly gift depends, I would argue, upon healthy public spaces. In a joint statement issued by President Nelson and the NAACP in 2020, in response to the murder of George, of George Floyd on a Minneapolis sidewalk, President Nelson noted that Jesus of Nazareth came that we might have life, have it more abundantly. We should follow his example and seek for an abundant life for all God's children. This includes protecting our brothers and sisters who have been wronged and bringing to justice those who have taken life or broken the law, thus robbing others of an abundant life. I find it hard to imagine creating an abundant life for all of God's children that does not rely to a large degree upon healthy public spaces and the social infrastructure that public spaces make possible. In your efforts to create a more sustainable future for our planet and to create Zion-like communities, I invite you to consider participating in and supporting public spaces. Shortly after I arrived, uh, shortly after our family arrived in Provo, um, I was asked to serve on the city's planning commission. Uh, it's something that I felt really underqualified to do. I knew about um, city planning theoretically. I'd read Jane Jacobs after all. Um, but I mean, I had no clue how, how cities ran. But it was an amazing experience to be involved in that process and, and have the opportunity to advocate for and protect uh, public spaces here in Provo. I also uh, became really involved in uh, uh, what turned out to be a pretty contentious fight over the arrival of the UVX. Most of you arrived in Provo post-UVX existence. Uh, Pre-UVX pre -UVX existence, people, a lot of people in Provo were really, really concerned about its arrival, uh, concerned about the threats that it would bring to, uh, I think, their, their lifestyles, uh, their privacy, their safety. Um, being involved in the process of advocating with other neighbors and residents for public transit here in Provo has also been really rewarding. And I, uh, again, at the clo in closing, just invite you to, to find opportunities to do that, find opportunities to spend time in public spaces, find opportunities for, to advocate for public spaces. It's some of the most rewarding uh, uh, citizenship and spiritual work that um, I have done and been involved in here. And I uh, share these thoughts and, and offer uh, them in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. My turn.